Well, 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 it's time to revisit the worst possible subject. <laughs> I loathe to talk about it, but this is where we are, and it's the Maddie Healy and Taylor Swift interlude. And I think that upon reflection, at least a small amount of real estate on the Tortured Poets Department will concern the happenings of Taylor's hot girl summer. The intervening period between Jover and getting together with Travis, there was not a lot of singledom going on. You'll notice that Taylor doesn't like to be single for very long. We could also call Taylor's hot girl summer her idiot girl summer, but you know, really this was a hostage victim trying to relearn the real world as she knew it. She had been locked in a basement, making up stories and dreaming of freedom for years, like the movie Room, and now, she was free. So what did she do? Well, yes, exactly what I predicted that she would do. In one of my very first Jover videos, I talked about how Taylor would very likely, after this period of time, date someone truly rogue, someone her fans would hate, a bad boy, if you will, just to spice things up. And boy, was I right. Watch all my other videos on this because I chronicled it in real time as it happened. God, last summer was full of emergency videos. For a total primer, I will leave them all linked down below. But today we're talking receipts, timeline, proof, evidence of the ratty Healy interlude. I have to do a disclaimer on my position on Taylor's boyfriends because my perspective against Maddie Healy actually has nothing to do with him dating Taylor Swift at all. If you go back through my videos, you can see that I was pretty supportive of it and actually rather neutral on it because I am neutral about who Taylor dates while she's dating them. That's the key term, while she's dating them. But get this, I don't care who she dates because I only care when they become characters on the page with words from Taylor herself to dis decipher their place in her art. Then I become interested. So this is kind of why I'm not like Tavising all the time because Travis is not really real to me as a Swiftologist yet because I don't know how Taylor feels about it. We can guess, we can surmise, but I don't have words from her. So I reserve my judgment. And you know, I tried to do that with Maddie Healy, but his character, <laughs> his person, the way that he behaved in Malaysia, which is a country close to Singapore where I live, what he did in his time here was really not attractive to me. So I call him Ratty Healy and that's never going to change. And if you get upset or offended about me being mean to Taylor Swift's boyfriends, then this is not the channel for you. That is an old, old heirloom of Swiftyism to dunk on her ex-boyfriends. I've been doing it since this channel started. So if you don't like it, don't watch it. But if you do like it, my name is Zach. I'm the Swiftologist and I make thoughtful weekly videos about pop culture. We are so close to the release of the Tortured Poets Department and I am in shambles at this point. I literally don't know what to do with myself. Before we get into today's messy boots on the ground reporting, I want to say a huge thank you to the sponsor of today's video. Skillshare. I'm so excited to be working with them again because I've integrated so many things that I've learned on Skillshare into my workflow as a content creator. I'm always getting questions from you guys on how I create my videos and I don't think I've ever divulged any behind the scenes information about my process before. So here's an exclusive on how I learned to incorporate AI into my content production routine using Skillshare to help me put together outlines on short notice when I don't have a lot of time, like today, because you know I'm the king of an emergency video and I needed to make a quick recap of everything that happened in Taylor Swift's Hot Girl Summer with Maddie Healy specifically in a very short period of time. And I use Skillshare to help me do it. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives with a host of topics ranging from illustration and graphic design to photography, music, and productivity. And it's powered by a world-class community that connects like-minded creatives to learn from each other. What I specifically love about Skillshare is their learn by doing approach. I find their classes to be super interactive, particularly with the project creation after completing a class. And best of all, these lessons are on demand and completely stackable. So you can learn at your own pace, whether you're a beginner or an expert looking to go deeper on a subject like me with AI. This month, I took a class called Unlock Your Creative Potential with AI by PhD candidate in machine learning, Slay, and continued on my journey to learn how to use AI to make me a more efficient content creator. You may remember from my last adventure with Skillshare that I learned how to fine tune my chat GPT prompts. And I loved this course that I've just taken because it introduced me to some new AI writing assistants that I hadn't encountered before and that have made a profound difference in my creation process. For example, I learned about Merlin AI, which summarizes YouTube videos for you and also gives you timestamps for anything that you need to find. And this was super useful when I was combing through my own Maddie Healy videos and trying to come up with this timeline again. I don't really have the time to sit there and watch all my old videos and I don't always have my scripts on hand. So this is a really quick way to help me summarize things. And Merlin AI also helps you summarize articles and podcasts too. So if you're time poor and you need to digest a lot of information really fast, this tip really helps. The first 500 people to use my link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So 
definitely try it out and let me know how you feel about the class that you're taking. I really recommend this AI class. It has saved me a bunch of time and helped me be way more creative. I think it's very possible that a particular three track stretch on this record, which is Fresh Out the Slammer, Florida, and Guilty as Sin, are gonna be about this brief interlude. And you know what? I'm ready to hear about it because it was delusional and I can't make heads or tails of it. So I need the woman, the myth, the legend to speak on it herself. But let's go all the way back to the beginning, shall we? Well, not that far back to the beginning because I don't really want to get into the 1989 era, but just know that they had been kind of in contact in communication throughout that time. They were circling each other. Perhaps they were going to get together, but then Taylor met Calvin Harris and it all went downhill from there. But it could have gone downhill in another direction, I guess. She just waited to let it happen later. But there has been some chatter now in 2021 about Maddie and Taylor working together on Midnights. This is widely presumed to be somewhat true, I believe, with Ratty Healy even saying that there was a collaboration that just didn't make the cut onto the eventual album that Taylor was creating, which happened to be Midnights. What's important here to denote is exactly when Maddie re-entered the picture. We do know they were aware of each other in the 1989 era, and they may even have potentially crossed paths romantically then, but it didn't last very long, as I just mentioned, because Taylor got swept away by Calcium Harris, king of slamming doors so hard his shoulder almost breaks off. You gonna write any new songs for Taylor Swift? Or are you done with that girl? Renegade is written in July of 2021, or before then, that's when it was released. Now this was the sign of a dead relationship. If you don't know why, you better go watch my Jover deep dive video because I get all the way into it, but sorry dolls, it was literally Jover right then and there. Whether it was officially over or not, who knows? What we need to be watching out for around this time are for any moments where Taylor Swift was able to meet the band and was asked, do you have a man? And she replied, I don't remember. I am fairly certain that this lyric in Bejeweled is about an encounter with Maddie Healy when her relationship with Joe was really in I Knew You Were Trouble. So when was that song written, Bejeweled? I mean, towards the end of 2021. Joe is at this point currently on set with Jack Antonoff's now wife, Margaret, filming some flop movie that no one cares about and no one will see. Have you seen it? No. Exactly. This is in November, which is the same month when Taylor wrote You're Losing Me. Clearly being away from him for a long period of time had her thinking, stop, you're losing me. I can't find a pulse. My heart won't start anymore. Absence makes the heart grow weaker. Taylor and Joe then go on a last ditch of the relationship vacation when he wraps filming in Panama at the end of 2021. Taylor releases Red Taylor's version and the crowd goes wild. The crowd goes absolutely wild. We know that also around this time, while Taylor is working on Midnight's closely with Jack Antonoff, noted messy boots, Maddie Healy is also working with Jack Antonoff on Being Funny in a Foreign Language, the 1975 record. Could there be some co-mingling in those writing sessions? Jack is a ferocious gossip, we all know that, and I think that he's an agent of chaos too. Especially if he was aware of their prior connection, perhaps he organically linked them back up again. Maddie is singing his praises about how easy it is to work with Jack, which is kind of what everyone says, TBH, which leads me to believe that Jack holds a lot of people's secrets because he makes them very comfortable. Taylor and Joe are living rather separately in 2022. He's in Cannes for the premiere of his flop movie. Taylor's at Toronto Film Festival to talk about the all too well short film, which will well outperform anything Joe Alwyn ever stars in. She's giving her very mysterious NYU graduation speech, which is mostly about like moving on and being excited for the future. I mean, as she should, she knew what was coming. But we quickly learn from the HBIC herself that there will be a brand new record coming out in October at the VMAs in September. This is 2022 and Joe is nowhere to be seen until Taylor and Joe are papped furniture shopping on October 18th. Something that points to me that this was a rogue decision for her and unexpected by Joe, the Jover breakup, is that they were apparently like buying and designing a house together. She had some secret Pinterest boards for it and that all went dark after the breakup. So I think again, internally, she had made up her mind that it was over, but perhaps had not communicated or decided to pull the trigger on that at this point in time. I think this is a very convenient time for them to be photographed, given that the record was about to come out and I do believe that Taylor held off on formally ending the relationship in public so as not to eclipse both Midnight's and the Eras tour. Strong queen, smart queen, we support it. But it confused us. Meanwhile, Jack Antonoff, Taylor's bestie, who she's in like constant communication with, especially around album time, is posting stuff on Instagram being like, I'm with Maddie Healy in the studio, hee hee, we're having so much fun. 
Midnight's comes out and it's a roaring success. We all know exactly how that went down. In November of 2022, this is when Maddie reveals that he did work on something with Taylor and he said that version of it never came out. I'm thinking it might have been like an anti-hero remix or something because of the word version there. He says that it was for reasons that are not to be criticized. She's amazing. Interesting. So... What were the reasons? I'm curious, I would like to see it. Taylor is quoted on the record in a Pitchfork article at this time saying that the 1975's newest album, Being Funny in a Foreign Language, is so funny, which is fairly rare. She doesn't often offer her words verbatim in support in an interview context like that, especially when it's not about her. So why now? Why this record? She didn't go on the record about melodrama, but we're talking about being funny in a foreign language? Okay spoken like someone who's about to be dickmatized. Joe is cast in another flop movie that no one cares about at the end of 2022. This must have been like another kind of like, oh, you're really jetting off again moment. Although the era store was kind of on the horizon. So I'm sure maybe she was just like, I'm gonna sweat it out. Soon I'll cook that turkey, but I need to plot my escape route. Taylor then flies to New Orleans at the end of 2022 to be with Joe. They look kind of awkward together in the very blurry photos that emerge from this period of time. But I mean, it is hard to tell because they are like far away and low quality. In January of 2023, Taylor shows up at the 1975 concert in London and sings Antihero for the first time. Now, this should have been our first plane hitting the tower. We didn't know it at the time, but this was the beginning of something insane. Why would she perform her hit lead single from her untoured and basically unpromoted album with tour anticipation building by the second at a 1975 concert in London because she was dickmatized. That's the only reason why. She walked on stage and served a fantastic performance of a hit single. She used to reserve the first hit single performance for like the VMAs, not night three of the night six residency of a 1975 show in London, boo. This was also perhaps maybe rubbing salt in the wound, given that Joe and Taylor would break up in April. It can't have been good at this moment in February. Like surely it was very, very much so in its end stages. Maybe she was just tired of sitting at home and watching him play chopsticks on the piano and pretending to clap and cheer for him and then give him writing credits to you know, fund the rest of his life. Maybe she was tired of doing that, okay? Maybe she said she didn't remember if she had a man when Maddie Healy's manager called her and said, are you free tonight to perform Antihero Queen? Maybe that. Maybe so, have you ever thought about that? In February, Taylor attended the Grammy solo, but she is pictured wearing Joe's leather jacket at an after party, so they were presumably still by some measure in a relationship. In March, Jack is still working with Maddie on his solo record, I don't know what the update is on that, I don't care, and Joe Allen likes the last Taylor Swift post he will ever like on her Instagram. So March 16th is the day that happens and is the date to watch. The Eras tour starts on March 17th. Again, there is no Joe Turkey heirloom present in the stadium. There are no errant feathers on the floor. No one is hearing the gobble around the porta potties. This also should have been a sign. Why wouldn't the turkey attend the dawn of a completely new stratospheric era of his longtime girlfriend's career? It's not like he never attended any reputation shows. He could have showed up as he usually did with a hat on and scowled at the crowd, old scowls McAllen, and looked bored like he always did, but no. No. On March 22nd, Tree issues a weird puff piece to People Magazine about how Joe and Taylor are great together and how he supports her and that they hug and kiss when they have the time. <laughs> now, what was the point in doing this when the breakup was announced like barely two weeks later? I guess because they just didn't want this to become like such a big story during the first run of the shows. But still, it strikes me as an odd thing to do all of that when you already know it's over and you're about to announce it. So like, what's the tea? What's the gag? Was there an event? Was there an issue? Was there a glitch? I'm dying to know what the straw that broke the camel's back was. And I think that we will learn what it is in Tortured Poets Department. In February, they were maybe still working on it. So like what changed so drastically in March? We went from being at the Grammys to being 16 in the middle of Miami. So what happened? After Tree lets the world know that they kiss and hug in private, Taylor removes invisible string from the set list and replaces it with the one. Now that really was the shot heard around the world. She literally swapped out a sweet love song about you know being forever tied to the fate of her beautiful, gorgeous London turkey for a song about being miserable with the person you're with and longing for a past love that you no longer have. It was a crisis, it was a crisis. And the song has never made an appearance since. She has not cut or replaced any other songs on the Eras tour except for Invisible String. It's so 
weird to me. Why even put it there in the first place? Why not just start with the one? On April 6th, the episode of The Adam Friedland Show, where Raddy Healy made some rather heinous remarks that formed the basis of what would go on to become the hashtag Speak Up Now movement started by Swifties to boycott Taylor to make her stop dating him, gets removed from Apple and Spotify without comment. Isn't that interesting that an incriminating podcast gets pulled off of the internet two days before their relationship is announced, actually? April 8th, happy birthday, Maddie Healy, and rot in hell, Turkey, because this is the day that Jover is announced. You know what's so funny, and I have to toot my own horn right now, is that I'm always right. For weeks, I was contending with nothing knowers on Twitter who insisted to me that this wasn't real, that they were still together, and they would never believe they were broken up unless Taylor herself confirmed it. Well, divas, you're all so dumb and naive. That's not how this girly works, and I should know. I'm the Swiftologist. And has she said anything since? And do you still think they're dating? On April 10th, Maddie announces that he's ending his asshole era and deactivates his Instagram, following Taylor right before he deactivates. Who are you subliminally messaging the end of your asshole era to? Like, who's the target audience? Is it a girl who grew up on a Christmas tree farm? Is it her? Because at this point, no one was connecting the dots. There did not really seem to be a gradual getting close of these two. They had barely interacted in public by then. But, you know, yes, one could speculate that a certain leggy redhead said, girl, if you want to be dating this dog, you have got to give him a bath. You got to get rid of the social media. He's a liability and a disaster on social media. If you want to parade him around in public, you need to get a shock collar and a flea bath and a new leash. So that's exactly what happened. On April 20th, Joe Joe is pictured for the first time after their breakup looking like a mess. I love using this picture. I use it every chance I can get in my thumbnails. It's such a cartoonish fall from Grey's picture, a smack back to reality. It was all just a dream. One day I was on a private jet with 13 on the wing and now I'm on the tube to the publi. On May 3rd, the sun leaks that Taylor and Maddie are madly in love and ready to go public. They also say that Joe and Taylor broke up in February, which kind of, I guess, contradicts Joe's last liking of Taylor's Instagram post and the fact that they attended the Grammys together, and that also Taylor and Maddie have been FaceTiming and texting. They also say that Taylor's announcement of the breakup on his birthday was a present to him, and that is psycho because that is absolutely something that she would do. Now at this time, this article to me was preposterous. It was insane. It was bang out of order, but there was also a deep fear in my soul that told me there was some truth to it. I reserved my judgment, but the air pressure went all funny, and the light bulb started flickering. I knew then that we the Taylor Nation, have been possessed by a demon. And he starts doing an apology tour around the possession, saying sorry to Ice Spice on stage in New Zealand. One wonders where he was taking his marching orders from. On May 3rd, Maddie is singing his soppy song about you, and he mouths, you know who you are, at the camera. I can't even watch these videos back because they legit give me anxiety. Like this song is about a missed connection. It's about loving someone slowly and quietly over time, maybe from afar. And we know that this was written at the end of 2021 with Jack Antonoff while Taylor was making Midnight's. I shudder to think, I really do. I don't dare to dream. Do you think that I have forgotten about you is the lyrics. Like, come on, detectives. A day later, he says, she sure is, very gleefully, before he sings, she's American. And he also very emphatically sings, I've been in love with her for ages, and I can't seem to get it right. I fell in love with her in stages my whole life. These two drama queen alley cats. Was it that serious? Was it really that serious? It was never that serious. The way that they behaved on stage and in front of people, they were both acting the fool, Taylor included. Now, these things just ring true to their earlier missed connection and the potential flame during the 1989 era. I think that maybe Taylor didn't really want to pursue a relationship with Maddie around the time that they met, which was very early on in the 1989 era, because she was devoted to her girl boss imagery. The marketing for that record definitely hinged and centered around her positioning herself as an independent woman who does not need a man and is living in New York and making her best life with, you know, just her girlfriends around her. And I think when she ended up being ready to date someone after 1989 was promoted and done and like ready to be toured, then Calvin Harris swooped in. But fun fact, the night she met Calvin Harris, she was hanging out with Maddie Healy. Mm -hmm. I guess Calvin Harris just was a little bit braver. So then Taylor does the most insane thing she's ever done. Like this is actually crazy because it makes no goddamn sense. During Cardigan, she mouths on the Megatron for everyone to see, this song is about you. You know who you are. I love you.
if she had just stopped at you know who you are, it would be insane, but not certifiable. But now come on, how are we ending a relationship in February at the earliest and being in love with someone forever by May 6th? It's truly, truly Stockholm Syndrome. Like there's no logical explanation for this behavior. It was sick and twisted and completely riveting. I was seated. Is Cardigan about Maddie Healy? I mean, whatever. Cardigan is admittedly like a made up song about characters. So it's very easy to be like, oh, Cardigan is about whoever the hell I want it to be. I'm just glad that she didn't do this nonsense to an actual diva of a song that I'm attached to, such as the one. Now that would shatter a lot of my personal delusions about the subject matter of that song, but she didn't do it, so I'm happy. But either way, we can't be in denial anymore. We try, but we can't. And then all hell breaks loose when he appears at her show in Nashville. Yes, the rat flies 20 hours from the Philippines to Nashville to attend Eras, looking very grateful and joyous, I might add, to his credit, while being completely smitten and starstruck. <laughs> Here is a video of how me and my co-host Madeline from the evolution of a snake reacted to that news. Oh my god. Because he's... Maddie Healy <laughs> is there. There's a picture of it. Stop! Stop it! <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not responding to this. Everybody's like, get here now. I'm not responding to this. I have nothing to say to that. Why is How can we even go Julie on Baker. with this episode? Get a job. Get away from her. Okay, I'm literally, Get I'm going to open Julie this window Baker. and jump out of it. Ah! After that, we get news from the Daily Mail that he spent the night in her Nashville penthouse, not the fairy tale princess home where all the koi fish died from his stink. I just can't imagine him sitting there in one of those antique bird cages. Get out of there. Get out of there. You are not welcome. This is not for you. This is not to be desecrated by the likes of Ratty Healy. He is pictured the next day going to get coffee with one of her security guards in tow. And you know what? It caused a breakdown. Yes, the internet had a mental breakdown about this. Evolution of a snake included, but we didn't try and cancel Taylor Swift. A Taylor-friendly source reveals to Entertainment Tonight that Taylor and Maddie like each other and that Jack Antonoff reconnected them. This man is responsible for the most wonderful beauties in this world. Dress getaway car, cruel summer, and also world evils akin to the creation of the atomic bomb, such as reuniting these two dumbasses for a summer of chaos. On May 11th, Taylor and Maddie are allegedly cuddling and kissing at Casa Cipriani, a private members club in New York City. Later in Philly, Maddie performs with Phoebe Bridgers, who is opening for Taylor, and then jams out in a box with Scott Swift later that evening. Do you know what kind of derangement it is to introduce someone to your parents like a week after you start dating them? That's insane. On May 15th, our first official pap pictures of the two of them leaving the election Electric Lady's studio emerged, and I mean, Taylor looks really disheveled, which is really on brand for who she was dating. This was coincidentally like maybe the ugliest outfit she wore that year. Come on, girl, pick yourself up. <laughs> Let's go. We need to get back in the diva chair and stop doing this nonsense. On May 17th, the funniest Swifty moment ever happens. The speak up now movement begins. <laughs> and to me, this is one of the most ludicrous things that has ever taken place in the standum because it truly shows that the new Swifties just do not fundamentally understand Taylor Swift. Swift, and all of the fans who've been onboarded during the Joe period were just not privy to how she behaves when she's single. She's a messy boots. It's chaos. I was clapping and cheering. I was frowning, but I was also clapping and cheering because it's not serious because these people are not people that I know. It's absurd to try and pressure two celebrities into breaking up because you're mad at one of them. It's pathetic behavior, actually. Go and do something useful with your day. The letter, since deleted, says, we urge you to reflect on the impact of your own and your associates behavior and engage in genuine self-reflection for being papped walking out of a studio, for saying this song is about you on stage. And you know what? I urge everyone who took this letter seriously to reflect on their deranged, narcissistic, delusional impulse to try and micromanage the personal relationships of a pop star. You are not owed perfect behavior because you chose to remortgage your home to attend 17 Nights of the Eras tour. Get a job and move on or get in the crowd and eat your popcorn with the rest of us. On May 18th, according to the Daily Mail, which seems to be Joe's friendly outlet of choice, he feels slighted and distraught. Well, that's what happens when a diamond's got to shine and you were out building other worlds. Tough luck, Turkey. No sympathy on my end as per usual. Allegedly, Joe knew they were friends and were working together, but he was shocked to find this out. Well, my face was gray, but you couldn't admit that we were sick, so period. On May 20th, Taylor again is on the mic acting insane. She's at the surprise section of the show, which it soon becomes a source of terror for many of us. And she says that she's never been this happy in all aspects of her life. She emphasizes 
all aspects of my life because it's obvious that she's professionally killing it, but she wants us to know that her romantic life is happier than it's ever been. She says explicitly that it's not just the tour, but she feels like her life finally makes sense. And then she plays Question. I can't even get into that song choice and the implications of it. I have to go bleep, boop, bleep, boop, brain off on that one. But it is interesting how she was like, I'm doing great, right when Joe was like, I'm distraught. Hilarious behavior, queendom. Also, her life really didn't make sense at this moment. It was very confusing. She was in that post-terrible relationship, Lavender Haze. It levels out eventually, but you know, one shouldn't speak until it does. It's like how addicts really shouldn't make any major changes in their life until a year sober. Just... Give it a minute, give it a beat before you start declaring your happiness to the world. It's not just the tour, it's like, I don't know, I just sort of feel like my life finally feels like it makes sense. And, uh... May 24th, the Karma remix featuring Ice Spice is released. A lot of people think that this is Taylor doing damage control for her new man with the reckless mouth. But lo and behold, it has the opposite effect. It makes people get more mad and say that Taylor is being opportunistic and trying to rehabilitate the position of someone who doesn't deserve it. On May 25th, a source close to Taylor says that when Maddie's backstage, they'll kiss if she has time. This is so absurd to me. Taylor breathes when she has the time. On May 27th, Maddie is kind of vaguely addressing his relationship with Taylor on stage, playfully asking the crowd if they think that it's a bit or if it's sincere. I am going back and forth with asking myself that question too. Meanwhile, apparently, he's shipping a bunch of his music stuff to the States to work with Taylor. The source of this says very pointedly that this is for her next album. So like, we don't have the Tortured Poets writing credits. Could there be some of that work come to fruition? I can't entertain that thought. I can't entertain that thought. It scares me, it shonks me, but it didn't seem like they ended on bad terms and he hasn't really said anything mean about her, so it's possible. On May 29th, he's interviewed for The New Yorker, but he doesn't comment on his relationship. However, the reporter is inundated by texts from people who know both Taylor and Maddie saying this time it's for real. This happens with Taylor quite a lot when she wants to comment on something but doesn't want to give a direct quote. She'll authorize people close to her to say something on her behalf or give an opinion that is aligned with something that she has approved. So clearly, at this point, it's important to remember at the end of May, it's real, right? It's real. They're both taking pains to say that. On May 30th, Azalea Banks breaks her silence and sends a sincere and helpful warning to Taylor. She says, Taylor, this guy is going to give you scabies. When she hits, she hits. Sometimes, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day. And then on June 5th, the girl who is happier than she has ever been in her life, that finally makes sense, is now single. They're both extremely busy and realize they are not compatible. This is like 10 days after they were last seen together. Taylor announces the Speak Now TV track list minutes before the TMZ report dropped. Smart, but it didn't work. People were still distracted and paying attention to what the hell was going on here. I have like 85 million questions about this relationship that can literally only be answered by Taylor Swift. So I'm hoping that that three track stretch on Tortured Poets is gonna give us some of that insider juice and information that we so desperately long and yearn for. Because I don't know about you, but the events of last year were so hectic and crazy and over the top that I barely had a moment to like catch my breath or really try and figure out how I was feeling about it all. And Taylor speaks so infrequently to the press now that we barely get to hear directly from the horse's mouth how she's feeling about something or how something has impacted her. The only way that we receive messages these days is through the music and that's my preferred vehicle. But thank God we have this album coming because she has some explaining to do, some explaining to do Taylor Swift and I am seated. All right, well, this is the last video before our lives are forever changed by the Tortured Poets Department. Leave me a comment and let me know which of those three songs that we think might be about Maddie are going to be the most juicy. And also, why don't we just reminisce on the Ratty Healy era in the comments down below? What was the funniest moment to you? For me, it was Taylor on the Jumbotron saying, this song is about you. I love you. The I love you is really something that we moved on too quickly from. We need to circle back to that I love you and ask again, um, can we ask you a question? Who do you love now? She hasn't said she loves Travis yet, I don't think. In public, at least. She learned her lesson, but I'm seated. And I hope that you're seated, too. And don't forget to check out The Evolution of a Snake, the Taylor Swift podcast. We are going to be uploading so much content that you can get additionally to Swiftologists here. And I think that you would really love it. So come join our Patreon, because we're going to be having an absolute kiki there. And join our Discord server, because it's the only place to have a fun, smart, and hilarious, irreverent conversation without annoying ass people telling you that you're not allowed to call Joe the heirloom turkey. In my spaces, you are always given the permission to drag the turkey. And I will see you soon. Goodbye, Swifties.